Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Benbrook United Methodist Church. It's a joy and a pleasure to see all of you out here this fine Sunday morning, um, seeing some faces haven't seen in a while. That's really good. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, some people who've been here for uh, the last few Sundays. So all of that is good. Please make sure to tell your friends, tell your neighbors, uh, tell your loved ones. Uh, we are continuing to have service back in session, um, and we will continue to do so unless uh, unforeseeable events arise from here on out. Um, Going forward, uh, a few things that you should know. Um, Holy Week services are on the Evans. Does that make sense? So uh, Thursday, Monday, Thursday service is at 7, and Good Friday service is at 7, uh, and then the sunrise service is at 7 a.m., and then the regular service we'll have it here will be at 11 a.m. So if you can remember the Evans, you're good. So um, just kind of a little mnemonic device, I guess I, I have to do that. Um, so, um, so those services will be not this week, but they'll be the following week, and that will be Holy Week, and we'll be up on Easter before you know it. Palm Sunday is next Sunday. Um, and I know that is an important Sunday in the life of the church for a lot of folks. Certainly as a kid, that was one of the Sundays that I enjoy the most. So uh, come prepared to, to sing and come prepared to process and or, and or wave some palm branches and uh, get a little Pentecostal for a little bit. So um, as we move on into this week, of course, we do have Bible study. We have that on Tuesday nights. That is uh, we are in the book of Romans. We have a Zoom link for that. You can follow along with us in Zoom. Uh, we'll be covering Romans 2 and 3 and 4 if we have time. So uh, you'll want to come out to that and just click on the link and you can, you can uh, engage with us there. Other things that we have, um, if you have not had uh, communion with us before, just a little orientation to you. Um, there is a plastic bag uh, that you would have received when you came in. And uh, in that plastic bag, there is kind of, um, it's actually got two, con two things in it. On the top, underneath the plastic wrap, is your uh, wafer. And then underneath the metal foil will be your grape juice. So there are actually two layers to that, and when we come to the time, I'll indicate that again. Other things as we kind of move on into um, this week that we have going on, um, we will be having a, a set of online devotions next week for Holy Week. So uh, you'll want to tune in for those. Uh, you'll be able to find them on our Facebook or our YouTube channel. And um, there was one other announcement that escapes me, but I, I can't remember it at this time. Um, stay tuned. We will be having a church council meeting coming up here very shortly. So uh, please make note of that uh, if you serve on church council. You should be getting a link for that shortly. Um, if there are no other announcements, then let us go to God now in a word and time of prayer. Gracious and holy God, we come before you thankful. Thankful for this day, thankful for this time together, thankful for this chance to celebrate and rejoice with you and with the love that your son Jesus pours out to us this day and every day. Lord, we are transformed by that. We are renewed by that. We are refreshed by that. We are made whole by that. And in this season in the wilderness, in this season of Lent, as we journey toward the cross, we pray that you would lead us and guide us and direct us, that you would be the one who would indeed not forsake us. Remind us what it is to hold steadfast even in times of temptation and trial, even in times where we may feel discouraged, even in times where we may feel downtrodden and broken and lost. Remind us that you are with us in the wilderness seasons of our lives. Lord, be with all those whom we lift up before you in prayer. Be with all those whom we find are um, just struggling at this day. Be with those who are recovering from illness, those who are recovering from surgery, those who are 
recovering from loss in their own lives. Be with those joys that we lift up. Be with those times of, uh, of, of, of celebration for those who have received the vaccine, uh, those who are in the process of getting it now, for so many around our country who have received it and indeed around the world. We pray for your protection on those who are in need right now. And we lift these prayers up to you. We do so in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You've probably heard um, the expression good in our culture in a number of different ways, right? Um, you've heard it used, um, it's all good, right? Um, or uh, good times, um, or um, if someone asks you how you're doing, you might say, it's good, it's good, it's good. Um, um, you may have also heard the expression used, uh, good for nothing, uh, when described of somebody. Um, Folgers had a commercial saying for many years. Uh, their commercial was good to the last drop, right? There is this notion out there in the world that we have about what it means to be good. And that notion about what it means to be good um, often carries over into um, the way that we see people say about their life, well, they were a good person, sometimes I'll hear people say. Um, and they'll say that to me sometimes if they don't have anything else that they could add to it. Um, sometimes I think because they're struggling for something greater and deeper, maybe Maybe they were Christian, maybe they weren't in their lives, but a lot of times that phrase, um, you know, they're a good person, uh, gets, gets put out there. And yet the notion of what it means to be good is something that Jesus has a little different take on, at least in the scripture that we find before us this morning. Um, to set the stage for this scripture, it is in Mark's gospel, and it is um, shortly before, just a few verses before, um, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem for Palm Sunday. And so here we are, just a week out from Palm Sunday, and I wanted to read this scripture passage to you because it deals with um, a rich man, but also with poor men, and it deals with all men. Uh, in women, and I wanted to, to share it with you because I think it's important. It tells us a little bit about the nature of, of goodness. As he was setting out on a journey, and this is in Mark 10, chapter 10, verse 17, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go 
and sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say, look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children in fields with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Sweet Holy Spirit, remind us, revive us again. Restore to us your presence within us. May we be guided and led in the wilderness of this moment and in the wilderness seasons of our lives ever more fully by you. When we are unsure of where to turn or of what to know and of what even is good, may we find the goodness that comes from you. May we seek your wisdom in your face. May my words not be my own, but may they be yours. May my mind not be my own, but may it be yours. Most of all, sweet, sweet Holy Spirit, may my heart not be my own, but may it be wholly thine, broken and open and honest before these people of God. Amen. So as we look at this scripture today, um, it, it deals with, the nature of goodness. It is a scripture that is bookended by a discussion on goodness. And as we begin to unpack it, we see that Jesus encounters a rich man, a man who has many things in his life. And we have to understand that back in Jesus's day and to a certain extent back in our day, there is an association sometimes that The reason that people are wealthy is because God has blessed them. That that is the nature of wealth, that all wealth, that and and not only that, but that they have followed the rules, and by following the rules, that wealth has come upon them. And the rich man is one on many accounts who has followed the rules. He, that is Jesus, tells the rich man in response, you know the commandments, that is, you know to follow the rules, you know what you are to do and what you are not to do, right? You know, don't murder. Don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud anyone, honor your father and mother. Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. He's been a good boy. And yet, note the nature of the question that he asked Jesus. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Does he just say it honestly? Does he say it because maybe 
who knows, maybe he's even trying to suck up to Jesus? Good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Like, you know I'm a good guy, right? You, you know. I mean, like, look at my standing in the community. It, it must mean that I'm good because I have this wealth, I have this influence, I follow these rules, I follow these laws, then surely I must be good. And from one good guy to another, good teacher, let me in on this little secret. Jesus says, you've done all these things right. You haven't skipped a beat on that. Good for you, you went to Sunday school. You know all the commandments. But looking back at him, it says Jesus in verse 21, looking at him, loved him. Note that key word, loved him and said. Didn't just speak to him, but spoke to him out of a deepness of his heart, said, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked, and he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. See, his goodness he equated in part with his status. His goodness, his influence in the community, his goodness was equated with his stuff that he had. And Jesus recognized that until you were able to let go of everything and follow me, then you just haven't let go of it all. And you're not following after me and you're not after the good news. He couldn't let go of his stuff. He could not let go of his stuff. It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing for us to let go of our stuff, right? And I, I don't just mean, you know, the stuff that you have in your house, right? You know, my grandmother um, collected um, uh, Cool Whip uh, plastic tins, and she collected, some of y'all are looking at each other like, uh, but I mean, after she had passed away, like we found them all in one corner, and then we found um, uh, ketchup and tartar sauce from, um, uh, where was it, um, from Captain D's that she had in the refrigerator, and I mean, she just, she stored stuff, okay? I'm not saying that you got to get rid of that stuff. I'm not saying that what Jesus wants from you is a clean house. And, you know, until you get a clean house, uh, you're not going to be good in Jesus' eyes. That's not what I'm saying. That's a misunderstanding of this. Because there are people that, that say for all kinds of reasons that are justified and, and good. But even deeper than that, we all have baggage that we haven't given over fully to Jesus. All of us have stuff that we are holding on to. I saw a meme, it's been a few years ago, and it said, everything I've ever let go of has had claw marks on it. It's painful and we laugh because it's true. Everything I've ever let go of has had claw marks on it. See, we've got stuff that we're holding on to. We've got stuff that, that we can't give over to Jesus because will it change our status with him? Will it change our relationship with him if he knows about that stuff? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. He already knows about that. whether you've told him or not. 
but because he loves you, he still wants you to tell him. Because he loves you, he wants you to open up, to not be one who hoards your life and hoards those things that are important to you, but to share every joy that you have, as well as every hurt and hang up with him. And if you're walking through this wilderness of Lent, maybe that's where you've gotten hung up. You haven't been given over everything. You've been given over it piecemeal. Because the reality is it's scary to give over everything. That is the reality. It is a reality that the disciples struggle with. It's a reality that so many people that encounter Jesus in the gospel struggle with. And it's a reality that we struggle with too. Because there is just stuff that we don't want to get rid of. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. See, the thing is, a lot of us are trying to hold on to our stuff because we think that we can save ourselves. We can't save ourselves. Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. We are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are not saved by our own works. We are not saved by our own possessions. We are not saved by our own stuff. We are not saved by our own achievements. We are not saved by our own goodness. We are saved by Jesus Christ and him alone. But we're hanging on to that stuff because we think it's going to help us. But it doesn't help us at all. So Peter, right? Peter the brash one. Peter the one who's thinking he's got it figured out. He comes back with this. He says, he began to say to him, um, uh, look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus understands that Peter is one to just kind of open his mouth and speak freely. It's not that he's entirely off base, but he just kind of, redirects Peter, as it were, in this moment. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. You see, there are ways that this world categorizes who is first and who is second and who is third and who is fourth and who is fifth and who is sixth on down that list, right? There are ways that we categorize who is the greatest and who is the least. Um, I, I'm not big into sports, but I, I do like to like, I like to watch March Madness. And one of the reasons I love to watch March Madness is because the teams that are ranked high invariably get toppled by the teams that are ranked low. And I love that. I, I love that. Um, and I'm sorry for all you Texas fans out there last night. But Texas still won. It just wasn't the same Texas. But it is a topsy-turvy sort of kingdom that Jesus preaches. 
It's a kingdom that is not in line with the way that the world views things. It's a kingdom that's not in line with the way that the world has oriented and has stacked things. It's not based on wealth. It's not based on power. It's not based on riches. It's not based on stuff. It's not based upon influence. It's not based upon all of these other things. And you can Google and you can get that list, whatever it is that you want, that puts somebody else up there. Jesus says, look, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. If you've given up everything that you have, if you truly don't have anything that is holding you back, you have one thing that is greater than all those things, and that is the good news. And the good news, the gospel, Evangelion, is the greatest news. There is nothing that is better than Jesus. There is nothing better than his love for you. There is nothing better than the way that even in the midst of this rich man coming to him, that Jesus out of love says to him, friend, give up your stuff. What are you struggling with today? What do you still need to give up? What are you holding on to? For fear of missing out, FOMO is is sometimes said. For fear of losing. Whatever you lose, you gain back. And all the more with Jesus because he is the good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
As we continue on in this service together, we come now to a time of Holy Communion. And as we come to Holy Communion, um, again, you don't have to have it all figured out. Um, you don't have to be perfect to approach God's throne of mercy and grace. You just have to be you. You just have to be honest. You have to desire change because I guarantee you that Jesus will meet you in those moments and in that time. It is not something that we get to do once in our life. Um, had a pastor I came to once and I said, you know, there are these street preachers out there. I said, they're troubling me. He said, why are they troubling you? He said, because they keep asking me if I've been saved. And I tell them all the right answers. I've been saved because I believe in the blood of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross, he rose again. He said, the problem is you understand it differently than they do. I said, what do you mean? He said, they are saying, have you been saved once? You should be responding with the question of, when am I not being saved? Every day of your life, you are being saved because of Jesus Christ. Every time we gather, we are being saved. Every time we partake of this feast, we are being saved anew. And when we break this bread and when we lift this cup, we do it together. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ, offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with each other, one with Christ, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Receive now this benediction. May you go forth in the goodness of God and of God alone, embraced by the love of Jesus Christ and sent forth by the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Go forth in Jesus' name. Amen.